I can't hear you guys. Oh, we had them muted. Yeah, we were muted. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because my other county computer, it got stuck in airplane mode, the other laptop. So I'm on a different one today and I didn't know if the settings were going to work for audio and video. You're loud and clear. Yeah, I can hear you too. Good. Then y'all say hi. Oh, geez, I'm trying to. Hi. Yeah. I'll drag her in too. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started in two minutes. I'm going to stream it live to Facebook. So just be aware that it will be live on Facebook and we're recording so we can use it in the future. And I'm going to have all the participants muted while our presenters are speaking, but you can use the chat box to ask questions and give us feedback and we'd love to hear from you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We are live on Facebook and here on WebEx. Thank you for joining Palm Beach County Victim Services with our Denim Day Rally. Denim Day looks a little different this year, but we wanted to make sure that we did everything possible to spread the awareness and message that what you are wearing is never an excuse for rape and that we are available to victims and survivors of sexual violence. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you want in the chat box, if you wanted to let us know what city you're coming from today, or if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can let us know what city you're watching from. And if you miss the live version, it will be available on our Facebook page later. I'm gonna go ahead and share our presentation for you today. So today is officially Denim Day. This is a worldwide event and you are participating in Palm Beach County Victim Services and Certified Rape Crisis Center's Denim Day Rally. So thank you for joining us. Our speakers today, I'm Holly Caratanudo and I'm the Sexual Assault Outreach Coordinator here at Palm Beach County Victim Services. We have Jen Kuypers, she's one of our Palm Beach County Victim Services advocates. She's gonna speak about our advocacy services we have Julie Weil, who is here with me today. You want to say hi, Julie? Wait. Our survivor, <laughs> activist, and the founder of the Not Just Me Foundation. And then we have Crystal. And Crystal, I'm not even going to try your last name. Crystal is our therapist here at Palm Beach County Victim Services, and she's going to speak about victim blaming in a little bit. How many of you have actually heard the Denim Day story before? I'm going to stop sharing this really quick and put a little poll out there. Let's see. So let us know if you've heard the, palm, the um, Denim Day story before. a lot of yeses on our WebEx, and I think that's because we have a lot of our team joining us today that have heard this Denim Day story. All right, so thank you for participating in that. So Denim Day comes from Italy in 1992. There was an 18-year-old who was raped by her 45-year-old driving instructor. This was during her first lesson with this driving instructor instructor. She reported the rape. He was arrested right away, prosecuted, and convicted. He appealed the conviction, saying that they had consensual sex during this time. And the Italian Supreme Court actually overturned his conviction, and he was released from jail. And the courts argued that the victim was wearing very tight jeans, and she had to have helped him remove them. And so it couldn't be considered sexual assault. 
when people in the court system heard of this conviction being overturned, especially the women, everyone was very upset. And the women in the court system in Italy wore jeans to protest that what you're wearing is never an excuse for rape. And their story and this person's story has become a movement. And it started in California, I believe in about 1999, where they started this movement in the US. This is the first time I really heard about sexual assault and, and awareness was hearing the Denim Day story back when I was in college and being just completely amazed that people in this day and age could still say that what someone is wearing gives someone an excuse to sexually assault them. And so now we continue to support Denim Day and wear jeans to let people know that what you're wearing is never an excuse. And it was started by Peace Over Violence, which is out of um, Los Angeles. So if you wanted to learn more about their organization, that is some information at denimdayinfo.org. All right, so now we're just gonna see how much you know about Palm Beach County Victim Services Services. So let me close our first poll. We're going to do a new one. All right. I'm gonna open that poll up for you. You guys get that poll? Can I get a thumbs up if you got the poll? Thank you. All right, great. Everyone participated in that, seems like. Great. All right, so I'm gonna share our presentation again for you all. I'm going to turn it over to our advocate who's going to talk about our services. Hi, all. Uh, this is Jen. I am here to speak with you about um, specifically the services that are available to sexual assault victims through Palm Beach County Victim Services. Um, I really want to stress that we are available um, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. That includes after hours, weekends, holidays, um, and there are multiple advocates. Um, on at any given time. So there's always someone available to answer your questions, especially um, if it is a crisis, we're here to provide information and support and we're mobile. So we'll come to you, um, we're able to meet you, whether it's at a hospital, um, a safe public location, your home if that's safe, um, law enforcement agencies, and of course the Butterfly House, which we'll get to. Um, we assist with arranging forensic examinations or um, what is commonly called a rape kit. So. Um, immediately after a sexual assault, we have 120 hours to collect evidence and an advocate is included in this process to, um, to dispatch a sexual assault nurse examiner or a SANE and to um, facilitate that process. I am a little ahead. Um, the Butterfly House is a freestanding forensic collection site. So we really recommend while we can come meet victims in hospitals or emergency rooms that we utilize the Butterfly House because it really is a more comfortable experience for the victim. Um, it's freestanding and unmanned, meaning that nobody is there unless a victim advocate is contacted. And we're available again 24-7, 365 to meet um, victims and other professionals like law enforcement and sexual assault nurse examiners. Um, at the Butterfly House where we can complete everything from um, the sexual evidence collection kit um, to the tape statement with law enforcement if victims do choose to report. So, um, you know, we really stress that this is a comfortable place where you can um, meet with an advocate and really a one stop shop where there aren't people coming and going. Um, there is food and drink available. There is a shower there and we also keep um, goods like clean clothes and underwear that victims can change into if we do collect clothes, which happens. Um, it's right adjacent to the Wellington Regional Medical Center's emergency room. So you won't enter the emergency room to access the Butterfly House, um, but we would just direct someone to head to the Wellington Regional Medical Center where we will meet you right next door. How an 
advocate can help. Um, again, we respond all year long, day and night. Please call us if you have questions. If you're not sure what your options are, um, we're there to talk with you about what's available and um, how you best want to proceed. And if you don't know, we're there just to provide support. Um, anytime, please call us. If a victim does request a forensic examination, um, the advocate will be the one to dispatch the same nurse to complete an exam within 120 hours or five days. Victims can be brought to the forensic exam um, site at the Butterfly House, whether or not they are um, currently in an emergency room, we're able to do what we need to do there and get you to the Butterfly House. Um, we can assist with transportation if that is of concern. So we don't ever want transportation or lack thereof to be a barrier to you getting um, the forensic evidence collected. Again, it's operated by um, Victim Services. It's located outside of the Wellington Regional Medical Center. It's a private and secure space um, for you to do all that you need to do, whether or not you want to report. Um, and just to, to really meet with someone face-to-face -face that can discuss what options are available. Um, the services are available whether or not an adult victim decides to report to law enforcement. So really important. We want everyone to understand that if you are an adult, you have the option whether or not you want to report your sexual assault. And if you decide at that moment you're not ready to report or you know that reporting is not for you, um, we can still collect that forensic evidence that is time sensitive. So if that you change your mind, um, that, that critical evidence is still there and you have a few years to change your mind. Um, we're not there to tell you what we think is best for you. We really trust that um, you can make that decision. We will honor that decision. And we just want you to, um, to do what's best for you in that moment. And if that's collecting evidence, we want to facilitate that for you as well. All right, and now we're going to move on to our therapist, Crystal, who's going to talk about victim blaming and how you can respond to victim blaming. Right, so hi, I'm Crystal. Um, I'm one of the licensed therapists with the um, from each county victim services. And through sexual assault, we also come across quite often um, the concept of victim blaming. And as it says in the slides, it's an attitude which suggests that the victim rather than the perpetrator is responsible for the assault. We see this far too much. Um, and it can happen over time, it can be very subtle, um, but the impact of the victim blaming is, is significant. Um, it can even uh, create a barrier between the victim wanting to move forward with pressing charges or feeling unsafe, um, invalidated, um, fearful, and questioning whether or not um, they were responsible for the, the sexual assault. Um, there's typically a level of, of, of fear associated with it. Um, and as it says in the second bullet point, it reinforces what the abuser has already told the victim. Um, we do see a correlation between victim blaming and the impact of mental health issues, especially in terms of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And it's something in, in therapy that we spend a significant amount of time on because it's, it's important to reframe that feeling of guilt and, and shame and blame um, that comes with it. Um, so at some level, most of us, we have rosy colored uh, glasses on, and we want to inherently believe that people are good. And that can be some of the background in terms of why victim blaming um, even exists. Um, it's, it's sort of self-protective, self-preservation, and that it can be difficult for us as human beings to believe that somebody would be able to, to assault somebody and do this. So we tend to gravitate to, towards that stance more so, but the detriment to, to the victim is, is really significant. Um, and impactful. So how to avoid it? Um, so com feeling comfort and, and being in control is, is incredibly important. And um, that's starting immediately um, from after the sexual assault has taken place. Law enforcement plays a big role in that. The, the victim advocates when they do the, the crisis um, counseling on scene, when they go to the butterfly house, and it comes up in, in therapy as well. Um, from a therapeutic perspective, um, when I see a sexual assault victim, it's very important that they feel like they can express and, and talk about the assault at their pace, using words that, that fit them, that 
feels comfortable and makes sense to them. So there's no one size fits all in this. It, you have to listen to the victim and let them sort of set the pace and the tone. Um, everyone's trauma response is different. So you may come across victims who remember a lot of details, maybe details that doesn't initially make sense to, to the listener, but it has an impact and it is important. And some victims may struggle with remembering anything. Both are very typical. And so you can't pinpoint and say, well, obviously they weren't victimized because of this reaction. You have to be careful with not making that uh, determination. Um, when you work on, on, on the side of, of interacting with victims, self-care is important for the person who is, who is listening and responding as well. So I preface that in, in therapy, self-care is important for the victim, but for the clinician, the, the advocates, uh, the same nurses as well. Um, some don'ts, very important um, accusation um, questions that sort of um, reinforces the whole uh, concept of victim blaming. What were you wearing? Were you drinking? Um, that, that sort of takes the stance of, of I'm supporting your perpetrator. If you hadn't had this much alcohol, this wouldn't have happened. So be very aware of, of the words that you use, how you ask questions and how you gather information so that it doesn't get the tone of, of blaming. Um, how to respond to it, very important. Always respond with empathy. Um, put yourself in their shoes. How would you want somebody to treat you if you were the victim? How would you want somebody to share that space with you when you're talking about very sensitive information? And then also important to, to challenge these statements. Um, if people are unaware of how their attitudes come across, we'll challenge that and say, well, it really shouldn't matter what they were wearing. They're still not at fault. They didn't consent. It's an assault happened, and we need to, to be careful of how we navigate that, that space. Um, so you can do that um, uh, by, by sort of reframing and, and countering these statements. Okay, so in terms of Palm Beach County um, Victim Services, we do have licensed clinicians and we do provide therapy, trauma informed therapy, both individual um, and group therapy, both in English and Spanish. Um, if you have been assaulted and you are interested in this, you can contact us by calling the Central Courthouse and I'll give the phone number. It's 561 355 2418 and option three. And you um, can request talking to our therapy coordinator, rather, um, Kathleen Cole, who will um, help you with the rest of the process and, and go from there. All right, thank you so much, Crystal. All right, so we are gonna move on to our next speaker, but I'm gonna ask you a poll before we get there. And while I'm getting the poll ready, I just want to make sure if you have questions, you can add them to the chat or if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can send a message through there as well to ask us a question. We're all here to answer questions. So our next speaker is Julie Weil. And I wanna know from you all, have you heard from, have you heard from Julie Weil before? I'm gonna send out a poll. Give me one minute here. Go ahead and answer the poll. Someone just asked if we all have denim on, and we definitely do. Yes, we can stand up, we can show you our denim. Julie has her We Believe shirt on. I have my denim day shirt on. And I don't know if you can see our jeans, but got, they're on. We got our jeans on. You ask and you shall receive from us here at Victim Services. All right, so I'm going to share our presentation again and let Julie take it away from there. Actually, I'm going to introduce Julie first because I want to make sure that you know all of the great stuff that Julie has been doing. So she is a survivor activist and she has been busy around the clock she literally has to jump off of this webinar and go talk with george washington university after this so that's awesome 
Um, she is the inspiration behind the Butterfly House, which Jen spoke about earlier. She travels the state of Florida to train SANE nurses, which are our sexual assault nurse examiners. She's won Florida Council Against Sexual Violence Survivor Activist of the Year, not once, but twice, in 2012 and 2016. She's an active member of RAIN, which is one of our national organizations, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. And she's on their Speakers Bureau, and she's also on the Board of Directors of Florida Council Against Sexual Violence. So she's not just helping us locally here in Palm Beach County, but she's helping us in the state network and in the national network. And not only that, she has traveled with the U.S. State Department. And she was part of a small team that opened the first rape crisis center in Egypt in 2016. So I wanted to make sure before Julie spoke, you knew about all of the great stuff that she's doing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Julie now. Hi everybody, can you see me? Thumbs up, right? Hello. Well, thank you Holly so much for that introduction. It's a real pleasure to be able to be here today. Um, I love celebrating Denim Day and everything that it um, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about my story, my experiences with victim blaming, and as part of the co-director of the Survivor Action Team here in Palm Beach County, I also want to talk a little bit about the experiences that people in the community have had that they have shared with us having to do with victim blaming. So you can see how prevalent it is and how it really does cause so much trauma after the fact and how it stops people from wanting to report makes them doubt themselves in their experience um so i'm going to start by uh telling you a little bit about what happened to me my experience was not here in palm beach county it was a little farther south in dade county and it happened in 2002 i was picking up my three-year-old daughter from our church preschool I had my eight month old son on my hip and there was nothing really different or weird about the day. We parked where we always did, it was around back by the playground. Um, the only thing different that day was that uh, my daughter had done something great at school. So we went to get a lollipop from the church bookstore. Set us off our, our time schedule a little bit, but no big deal. I was loading my kids into the car while I talked with one of my good friends, we were making plans to scrapbook that night. And um, the second she drove away, I heard footsteps behind me. And then I, fear, I um, felt somebody hit me over the head really hard. And it felt like that person hit me with a brick. What it was, was the um, handle of a six inch butcher knife. After he hit me over the head, he threw the knife across my neck and he told me not to scream. He told me not to make eye contact with him. He said that he had done this before and that um, if I wanted to live and I didn't want my children to die, that I would do everything he said. At that point, my daughter was screaming. She's trying to get out of the van. We assumed somebody would hear us because we were at church and um, our preschool was in session till 2.30. I just picked up at noon. And, um, but nobody heard us. And he slammed the door on my van, turned up the radio, and drove away. He went to my house looking for guns. When I told him I didn't have guns, he beat me up and he proceeded to drive my children and I out to the Florida Everglades, out into complete isolation. Um, while we were out there, he raped me twice in front of both my kids um, at knife point. He was a well-educated man. He talked about current events. He quoted the Bible. He talked about how many times he had done this before and all the reasons he had gotten away with what he had done. Um, then he took me to a bank. He robbed me. Um, and it was, what was really ironic is that um, he had me, he had been driving, he had carjacked me, when we went to the bank, I drove. And when we went up through the teller, the woman even asked, is there anything I can do for you today, Julie? And I had to say no, because people don't realize, you know, the power that someone has over you in a violent situation, whether that power is the words they say and the threats they make, or it's a weapon, whatever it is, 
you know, telling someone, well, <laughs> you know, I get that a lot. You could have just jumped out of the car. You could have just run away. There are a lot of other extenuating circumstances that people don't ever take into account um, because you're not there and you don't know what that victim is going through. Um, by the end of the day, he had raped me four times, all four times in front of my kids. Um, I was beaten. I was exhausted. My whole family was traumatized. And I was pretty sure I was never going to get off the floor of my van again. That, you know, at the end of the day, he had pushed the knife in the back of my neck. I blacked out because I thought I was going to die. Somehow coming, somehow coming, uh, coming to when my daughter started screaming that he had left our van. Um, but metaphorically, I think that I felt I would always be on the floor of that van. I was humiliated. I was beaten. I was scared. And I didn't know how I was going to go on to be a mom, to, to be a wife, to, to go on another day. I went home. I, uh, I knew my mom was home. So I drove to my mom's house. He told me he'd be waiting at my house. He had been taking my taking my driver's license. He said he was going to wait there to make sure I showered, um, and I didn't call anybody. But instead, I went to my mom's house, and when we were there, um, I called nine one one. I didn't want to, even in a situation like this where it was a complete stranger abduction. I was so afraid he would come to my house that he would find me, that he would kill me, that I didn't want to call nine one one. My father convinced me to call, and that's when everything got set into motion. The police, the first responders came to my house. Um, they took my statement. My father and I were begging, you know, the, the police to take me to the local hospital, not all the way down to the forensic exam site, which was a good hour away in traffic. But the first responder told us that people don't realize these rape crisis centers, places like the Butterfly House, are such an improvement. Because rather than going through the ER at your local hospital, um, when you go to a dedicated rape crisis center, you have a sexual assault nurse examiner who's trained to look for evidence in a specific way. Somebody who's trained to have compassion. You're seen in a solitary space where you don't have to triage through the ER. An advocate is provided there for you. Um, you're not separated in the ER by flimsy curtains between you and the next person. It's a, it's a dignified situation where you're treated with the best care. So lucky for, for me, I had, law, I had law enforcement not only believe me when I relayed my experience, but explain to me the protocol while we were going and explain to me why, the, why a place like the Butterfly House is so important. Um, hey, there's so many details to this story, but I'm going to skip over um, and just point out the fact that it took four years for my case to go to trial. It's a really long time. Um, my suspect wasn't immediately identified. His DNA was identified as being in my kit. They found it on my shirt, but there was no identity in the system. And although they could match it to three other cases of DNA, they knew he was a serial rapist. We didn't know who he was until six months later. He was caught uh, via America's Most Wanted. Um, but all that aside, it took four years for my case to go to trial. During those four years, he went through six attorneys. I went through two. Um, I had to retell the story over and over again. There were so many times when I was made to feel like I had done something wrong. There were so many times during all those years when I would relay the story to people, even some people close to me who would say, why did you park back behind? The church that day. Why did you park close to the playground? I always parked there. My kids like to play. Why, you know, why did you dilly dally going out to your car? And I've had people say, what were you wearing? What did you do to make this guy pick you out of everybody? I was wearing a Tinkerbell shirt that my daughter picked out, a pair of khaki cargo shorts, and a pair of Ked's tennis shoes. I was definitely not asking for anything or is anyone in the, in the case of sexual assault. Um, but those, those questions coming at me after of such a horrific case just really opened my eyes that people will look for anything to blame. And I think a lot of it goes back to what had been said before me, and that's that we want to believe we live in a safe world, and we want to believe that 
not everybody out there could be an abuser. But the truth is that people who are sexual predators are sexual predators. It doesn't matter their education level, doesn't matter their socioeconomic group, doesn't matter anything. The man who abducted me uh, grew up in an upper middle class neighborhood in Miami. He had two parents. His dad was law enforcement with the ATF. His mom was a church secretary. He was educated. He had children. It can be anybody. And I think that, you know, as a society, we make excuses because we want to feel safe ourselves that we wouldn't do what that victim did. We would never fall prey to somebody like that. But we have to reorient our thinking because anybody can be a sexual predator. It's a choice on their part. You don't set them off one day. What I was wearing that day at the church wasn't a trigger for that person. That person was there hunting for people weeks before. Know, I gave him the opportunity to take me. Um, so victim blaming is a real sore subject with me. Um, in my case, there were three cases before me. Once they identified him through DNA and they went back and looked at the reports, the other victims in the three cases before me, they weren't believed. Actually, four cases if you include the case up in, in Northern Virginia where he raped an acquaintance of his. It was a he said, she said. They had been drinking. You know what? They never ran the, the rape kit because, you know, she was dressed provocatively. She had been drinking. Well, had they run that rape kit a million years ago, they would have found that in the three next cases, four next cases, he was the same perpetrator, whether he violated against somebody he knew or a stranger. But what happened to the three women who did report to the police before me is that they were met with blame when they came forward one of the women one of the women was called a crazy housewife spinning tales you know because everyone was abducted from a church everybody was taken in the presence of their children out to be raped and it just sounded too too unbelievable one of the women left her car doors unlocked well that was her fault she shouldn't have done that one of the women was changing her child in the back of her minivan because she didn't want her kid to drive home or ride home in a wet diaper well she shouldn't have done that either so blame doesn't ever lie with the victim. It always lies on the perpetrator. And what happens when you treat someone like they had a, a hand in their own demise or in their own tragedy, it really undermines their ability to work through what happened to them because they feel accountable for what happened. It stops them from reaching out to get the help that they want because they fear that they're going to be met with disbelief. They fear that people are gonna poke holes in their story. And then they start to think, well, maybe I did do something wrong. Maybe I don't have a valid reason to come forward and get therapy or make a police report. And that's not true. The false reporting rate for, a lot of people believe, oh, well, a lot of sexual assaults are false reports. They're people who had morning after regret. The false reporting rate for sexual assault is the same or less than it is to other crimes. And I'm not sure why we as a society jump to that excuse that the victim must have done something, that it was a he said, she said. Um, what I like to tell people when I go out and I educate people, and, and even when I had a chance to go to Egypt, where they believe that rape is hardly ever a crime, is that rape isn't about sex. It's not about somebody finding you attractive or somebody wanting to have sex with you. It's about power and violence and that's what rape is. It's not about a miscommunication gone awry. And, and people need to realize that and start holding people accountable for what they've done. You know, you've heard the excuse, boys will be boys. Well, what do you expect? Well, that's not, that's not the response we should be giving. I have a son, he's 18 and going off to college. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to read something for you guys about consent. Bear with me for one second while I get to it. I want to, can I read this? I want to read this because I think it really goes to victim blaming and it shows, you know, we don't know what consent is in our society. A lot of it is still in our heads as something somebody does to incite somebody else. When it comes to sex, silence is not consent. 
Just because someone doesn't say anything while you're pushing sexual activity on them doesn't mean that they're okay with it. Flirting is not consent. Just because somebody's interested in you and likes talking to you doesn't mean that they wanna be touched. Consent for one thing is not consent for everything. If someone consents to make out with you, that doesn't mean they're consenting to have sex with you. Everyone has boundaries and at each level, those boundaries need to be respected. Having sex before with this person is not consent to having sex now. Just because it happened in the past doesn't mean you're obligated to, to agree every single time. Dressing in sexy clothing is not an invitation. It's not consent to rape. If a person is underage, it is not consent ever. Being afraid to say no is not consent. A lot of people say, well, if a woman doesn't struggle and doesn't fight and doesn't scream and doesn't say no and doesn't have bruises, that she wanted it, that it was okay. That's not true. Coercion can come through violence. Coercion can come through threats. It can come a lot of different ways. So just because a person doesn't scream no or struggle or fight doesn't mean they're okay with it. Going into a bedroom with somebody is not consent. Maybe is not consent. Being intoxicated is never consent. No is not consent. Any sexual activity without a verbal agreement between two people in a sober situation, enthusiastically and consensually wanting to do things together, anything aside from that is not consent. And if we educate ourselves on that better and we start teaching our kids what is and what is not acceptable, then all of a sudden, we can stop blaming people and we can say, well, if it's not boys will be boys. People need to know that these are the boundaries. And these are the legal boundaries <laughs> um, to what consent is. And when you do that, all of a sudden people realize, it's not my fault. I don't have to carry the shame for my whole life about what happened to me because I brought it on myself. I've seen, I, as, a, as an activist and somebody who travels the country speaking on this, I have seen so many people who have never gotten up off the floor of their minivan, metaphorically speaking, to move forward because they don't think they're allowed to. And they don't think anybody's gonna listen. Um, something that we touched on before is people have all different responses to rape. You can be calm, you can be hysterical, you can be angry, you can be sad, you can be ap absolutely apathetic. But that doesn't have anything to do with the, the, valid the validity of whether or not somebody was raped ever. Everybody reacts to trauma differently. And it's not us up to us to decide if that person was sexually assaulted. That is why we wear these shirts that say we believe. And that's the, uh, that's the mantra here at Palm Beach County Victim Services. We're part of the national movement, Start By Believing. And the foundation I run called the Not Just Me Foundation, these are our shirts because the first and foremost thing we want people to know is that you need to believe victims. People don't make up stories. People don't, you know, consent to three hour forensic exams because it's fun. It is grueling. It is grueling to deal with the after effects of sexual assault and talking about it's tough, going to get help is tough. Let's not make it any harder for people. And so I feel like for my journey, I was believed by the police that came to answer my call. The woman before me who suffered under the exact same perpetrator was not met with belief. She was met with disbelief. She was poo-pooed, oh, I think you're kind of making this up. And you know what happened? She dropped out of the system. She didn't continue to follow things through with the police. She didn't get therapy. And her life reflects those choices of being fearful and you know trying to work it out in her own way and people are all different but let's not let our response be the barrier to how somebody moves forward um so i was very fortunate i was taken to forensic exam center where i was treated with care i was i had good state attorneys that fought for me and excellent police that searched for this person um and we want to make sure everybody has and that's part of the reason that I wanted to help create Butterfly House here. And I've started this organization because it shouldn't matter where you're assaulted, whether it happens in Miami and you have a great experience or you have a bad experience, or it happens in Detroit 
or it happened to you 10 years ago, or it happened to you 10 days ago, everybody is entitled to be believed. Everybody's entitled to get care and counseling. And everybody is entitled to heal from what's happened to them. And that's what we want people to know. The blame never lies with the victim, ever. It always lies with the perpetrator. Because sexual violence and sexual assault, those are choices that one person makes to hurt another person. So let's put the onus back on them. Let's put the accountability back on them. And let's let the survivors in our community, in our state, in our country, start coming forward in a more compassionate atmosphere and not hear all these excuses. Let's just hear the statement, I believe you. Please tell me your story. And then we can help them. So I know this is a lot to digest today, um, but I hope people understand what you say that resonates in a person's mind moving forward. I had a lot of great people around me. The few negative comments that I received about why I parked where I did or, you know, why I didn't jump out of the car or I didn't, you know, do this or that, that's what rings in my ears. And that's on my hard days, what I focus on. And I don't want to. I want to focus on the good things that happened. And there's so many good things here in Palm Beach County, so many great services and great people here to help you, that I just really encourage you that no matter when this has happened to you, no matter how you're struggling, we will believe you. And we want you to come in and we want you to get the help that you deserve. So thanks to Palm Beach County for letting me come on and speak. I'll turn it back over to you. All right, Julie, thank you so much. And someone asked about what Julie had read about consent, and I will share that on our Facebook page, Palm Beach County Victim Services from Julie, because they liked it so much, they wanna be able to keep okay, that great. about consent. Um, so we'll share that. And I think Julie's story is such a great reminder that perpetrators often commit sexual violence more than once. And just imagine if we believe that first victim and they get the services that they need, and they were able to help them and convict that person, how many people wouldn't have to experience sexual violence if we only believed that first person? So I really appreciate Julie sharing. She's a volunteer with us. She comes in on her own time and does things like this. And I wanna make sure before I move on that we didn't miss um, any questions because I can't see the chat box. So let me just check. Thank you for Jen for sharing our phone number if anyone wants to contact us, like we've said, we're available 24 seven. We know that even during times of physical distancing, that sexual violence continues to occur. And we wanna make sure that you know we're here, we're in the office, we are operating, and we will be able to meet you at Butterfly House and help you with anything that you need. Even if it's just speaking to someone on our helpline, feel free to give us a call. So let me go ahead and um, share presentation again and we will wrap up but just remember if you have any questions feel free all right what you can do today so today as it is denim day the way to stop victim blaming is to make sure we change the, the social norms that it is never okay to blame the victim so share that denim day story with your networks we're at palm beach county victim services on our facebook page our Instagram is at PBC Victim Services. So take a picture of your denim, tag hashtag Denim Day PBC, and people will ask you, what is Denim Day? And now you can share the Denim Day story too. Challenge victim blaming statements. Crystal talked about making sure you um, let people know that it's not okay to talk about victims that way and to say to them, how would you feel if you were that victim? Empower those around you to use empathy. I think sometimes it's, we wanna become that bulldog in the fight and we wanna snap back at people when they blame victims, but take a step back and remember that they probably just have never experienced anything like that in their life and give them that empathy and help them to use empathy as well. These are our locations. So we have five locations throughout the county. So wherever you are in the county, we are here to meet your needs. Our main courthouse, the South County Courthouse, the North County Courthouse, we're out in Belglade at the West County Courthouse, and then our start center at 45th Street and Australian Ave. And then our health line, it's 247-561-833-7273. So please reach out if you ever need anything. And we will open it up if anyone has any last questions or comments. I'm seeing on Facebook, everyone's saying great job, Julie, she is a wonderful advocate. We appreciate her. 
And I, like I said, this will be, if you miss the beginning, it's on our Facebook page. And I, if I get really extra techie today, I might be able to upload it to YouTube. So don't count, hold your breath for that, but I'm gonna try. So we'll be able to share this. Um, it's recorded. We just wanna make sure that people know our services exist and that um, victims have a safe place to go if they need assistance. So thank you to Jen and Julie and Crystal for sharing their work today and their stories. Thank you all of you who participated. I think we have 13 people watching live on Facebook right now. And I'm seeing, I'm just kind of scrolling through all these people that we see here today. Lots of people who called in. Um, so go ahead over to our Facebook page if you want to watch the beginning again. Share it on your network, on your Facebook network. Today is Denim Day, but we really need to practice Denim Day every day and make sure our victims feel supported and feel believed. So thank you all for tuning in. Have a great day. Tag us in your pictures, denim day.